Hello, and welcome to Made in the County. My name is Monica Allier. I'm your host for today's episode, Raising the Curtain at the Regent Theatre, Then and Now. Made in the County podcast brings you stories, art, and music inspired by and made in Prince Edward County. Before we begin today's show, I would like to take a moment to acknowledge that we are recording at the Regent Theatre, which is located on the traditional territory of the Haudenosaunee Confederacy and other nations recorded and unrecorded. We are grateful to the generations of ancestral stewards and caretakers of this land for the opportunity to live, work, and share stories in this place we call home. As a community that claims many descendants from among the original Loyalist settlers, we are respectful of and grateful to our Indigenous neighbors in Tyendinaga Mohawk Territory and beyond who continue to work with us to find ways to reconcile with our past and pave the way towards an inclusive future. In creating opportunities, like this podcast, for shared storytelling, we aim to bridge the territorial and cultural divides which have separated Canadians. The Regent Theatre is a Prince Edward County landmark with a storied past. After having been closed for over a year due to COVID-19, the Regent Theatre is hosting its first live concert on September 30th. So we thought we'd mark the occasion with a podcast episode that looks back on the history of the region and ahead to the future. First, we'll take a trip down memory lane. That's where I come in. As a member of the Regents Board from 1999 to 2002, I'll share with you a few of my experiences. Next, we'll hear from local playwright, author, and composer Suzanne Pasternak, whose folk opera Minerva premiered at the region in 1994. COVID might be new to all of us, but it's not the first pandemic the Regent Theatre has seen. The Regent first opened its doors in 1918 at the height of the Spanish flu. And since then, it's gone through a lot of ups and downs. We'll speak with the current general manager of the theater about some of the challenges and silver linings that the most recent shutdown has brought to the region. And we'll end off with a sneak peek of the Regent's Truth and Reconciliation concert, their first live music show after the pandemic with a performance by multi-instrumentalist David R. Miracle. So let's get started. The Regent Theatre's story begins in 1918 with George Cook, a Greek immigrant and an entrepreneur with a vision to build a theatre in his new home of Picton. My first memories of the region were when I was a child. For a few years, my sister and I, who lived on a farm near Hillier, would spend a few days every summer with our town cousins. Now this is 60 years ago. On the Saturday, our aunt and uncle would give us each 10 or 15 cents, as I recall, to go to the afternoon movie at the region. They probably needed to get us out of their hair. Louise Cook, the owner and the daughter of original owner George, was famous to all of us. She was like a sergeant major walking the aisles to be sure we were all behaving. In my late 20s, when I returned to the county, she looked exactly the same, dark hair, dark pants, dark sweater, dark frame glasses, and her cigarette in a cigarette holder. But she could be playful. She even asked my then husband, who was a teacher, for ID one time in front of some of his students. They thought it was hilarious. Well, that was the late 70s. The theater operated intermittently through the next few years until finally closing in 1984. Now, in that time, I remember attending a couple of hilarious variety shows put on by the staff of the county hospital as fundraisers for some building project underway at the time. The Regent has continued that tradition of supporting our community members throughout the years since it subsequently reopened in 1994. It's been the supporting venue for the Rock and Review, Back the Build fundraisers, community theater performances, annual dance recitals, and numerous other fundraising events. It's a hundred year plus part of the fabric of this county. When its doors reopened in 1994, it was due to the efforts of a small group of visionaries who formed the Regent Theatre Foundation so the building could be purchased. Folks including Nigel and Susan Civil, Larry Taylor, Mary and the late David Taylor, the mission to actually purchase the region was done with major financial assistance 
from Edna Pierce Gordon, who remained anonymous until her passing in 2000. Edna was a good friend of Louise Cook, I learned. By the time I joined the board in 1999, there had been significant investments in the theater space, thanks to provincial and federal grants and individual community support. The new-to-us seats had been purchased from the Ontario Place Dome and removed and reinstalled at the theatre by volunteers. It was a mammoth undertaking, I'd been told, 300-plus seats. A new curtain had been purchased and other fire and safety issues of the day had been addressed and the fly tower had been opened, which, as I recall, brought with it bats. But the operational costs were massive. Taxes were $18,000 a year, as I recall. Gas was another $3,000 a month, plus hydro, water, sewage. Winters were killing us, even as we broke even with several versions of professional summer theater. And you know, it was this great community who came together to buy region annual memberships and offer their talents without charge to do shows to cover those bills and provide affordable entertainment, really, at that same time in the doldrums of winter. I do remember, because I got on council in the year 2000, that the municipality, like many of its rural counterparts in that day, was not on side with the arts as an economic driver, nor as a leisure activity that taxpayers should, should support in any way, unlike arenas, I might add. Four years later, the municipal annual grant to the region had grown, I can proudly say, from 2000 to 50000 close to where it is today, thanks to a whole lot of education about the merits of culture in rural communities like ours. After it was purchased in 1994, my daughter Emily, who was 12, agreed to go with me on one of the tours that they were holding. It would have been... I'm guessing either late fall in 1993 or March break in 94, I would guess. I do remember it was so cold and damp in that theater, and it had a cement floor, as I recall, and no rugs. It was just really cold. A few folks were going up on the stage, and Emily wanted to go up, and so she did. I watched her stand there for several minutes. When she came down, she said to me, I think I'd like to perform here one day, Mummy. She was 12. And perform here she has, along with countless other musicians and actors, thousands going back to the region's opening. The first performance for Emily was in September 1994 in the role of Minerva, and again in 2001 when Minerva was part of a summer festival as a full stage production with sets, etc. It was at that time we found out Emily was related to Minerva, and me too. Speaking of Minerva, now due to the crazy times we live in, our next segment with Suzanne Pasternak had to be done remotely. So please excuse any audio glitches. Minerva, such a fabulous play. We spoke to the playwright, Suzanne, and we asked her about all things Minerva and the Regent Theatre. Here are her own words on Minerva and how it came to be. In 1988, I was living in Prince Edward County. I was living in Black Creek. I came across a, a ballad written about Minerva Ann McCrimmon. In 1878, Minerva was the ship's cook aboard the schooner her father captained, the David Andrews. The David Andrews was an experimental design that did not work very well. It was a 125 foot long schooner that ran from Kingston to Oswego, Prince Edward County to Kingston and Oswego, Syracuse. And so her father taught her everything he knew. Captain McCrimmon taught Minerva how to sail and reef knots and she was an absolute wonder at it. So whenever the storms rolled in or the waves grew high, her dad would call her up from the galley below and give her command of the ship. And all the crew absolutely adored her and obeyed her completely. 
And then in 1882, when she was 21, um, the ship, the David Andrews, ran aground in a terrible blizzard off of Oswego. She ran onto the rocks. And Minerva single-handedly um, got each man safely off the ship. So this totally captured my imagination. And the first script was actually done weaving music and storytelling. It premiered at the community center in the hockey arena in Picton. I had no place to go. There was no other, you know, theater at the time. The following year, we did it again. And this is a huge cast of musicians um, and step dancers. We did it at Macaulay Museum which was a teeny tiny venue, could only hold 120 people, I think. And then the Regent Theater opened in 1994, opened her doors after many years of um, not being in operation. And to have a chance to do Minerva on that stage, plus there were a lot of seats. <laughs> I could sell a lot of tickets, but it was stunning. We, the musicians, and I had like the best crack shot musicians in the area and dancers. And it, backstage and looking up into that fly tower, we felt like we were in a cathedral. And when we went downstairs into the old dressing rooms that the vaudeville guys used to use there are all these blackboards in the changing rooms that still had the writing on them from the vaudeville days from the actors and musicians leaving messages for each other or set lists things like that it was just oh and their suitcase stickers were all over the doors and it was like the all uh, had just walked out last night and the acoustics in the region were just phenomenal. And that Regent Theater was always a home from then on for Minerva performances. They didn't have staff. They didn't <laughs> have crew. I think it was Rob Kello who climbed up this huge ladder to the top of... Um, the ceiling part where there were some spotlights so he could adjust some spotlights onto the stage. It was really magical and it is a magical stage, absolutely. So I was so lucky and of course we sold out big time and um, I'm the luckiest girl in the world. Minerva has been a play that has touched so many, but we were curious why it was important to the region and the locals. Having Minerva performed at the Regent Theater when she first opened her doors, it was only, I think, two weeks after the doors opened, after many, 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 many years. Um, as far as it being a good thing for the Regent, it was a great thing for the Regent to have this magical, magnificent show with the most incredible musicians. And Emily, at age 13, was such a tremendous addition to the cast and the telling of Minerva's story. It was important to the locals. Well, first of all, probably 90% of the people in the audience um, were related to the characters in my show, which all um, came from Long Point and South Bay, historically. And um, Minerva is buried in the little cemetery in South Bay. And what I noticed was how people, especially the folks who had some ties to these families from the past, the pride. And um, people say, oh, this is like the Anna Green Gables of Prince Edward County. No, Anne of Green Gables is not a real person. Minerva Ann McCrimmon is a real person and really heroic. And um, somehow it just touched people's hearts. That magic of the music and this unbelievably beautiful true story of this teenage girl um, just 
touch people's hearts immediately. I mean, there was a huge fan base for the show sprang up right away. And um, it's just so fantastic. So what an honor. And good job, Regent. What a wonderful theater. Minerva helped open the Regent in the past. Now the Regent is reopening again after lockdown. We asked Suzanne why she thought it was important for a theater like this to be open in the county. It is so very important that a theater like the Regent Theater is available to our community in Prince Edward County. First of all, it's a fabulous building and a real opportunity for people and people from away um, to get inside an old vaudeville um, slash opera house from the turn of the century or from the 1920s. And um, for the musicians and dancers, whoever are on that stage, it is just stunning, absolutely stunning. We all just feel like we're at home there. And of course, the movies, all those series, um, is a wonderful opportunity for people to be together. And the fact that you're, you know, bringing in operas from New York City, from the Met uh, on the screen here, it's just wonderful place and really, really important. And I, I hope that uh, we can keep it going. We thank Suzanne for joining us today. Before we say goodbye, we asked her what she is most proud of looking back. As the producer of uh, the folk opera in the Regent Theater in 1994, I can speak financially about what I was proud of. I was proud of a lot of paychecks I signed went into the pockets of musicians, dancers, sound guys, the region theater, print craft, the Gazette, you know, so um, the income that it generated for a lot of people and companies. Also, um, definitely the thing I'm proudest of in that performance, hands down. 13-year-old Emily Fennell premiering as um, Minerva. Emily had never really been on stage with a bunch of musicians and singing harmony and harmonies with me and using a microphone for the first time. And the musicians she was working with, and one of them, Craig Jones, was, you know, Stan Rogers, bass player, David Archibald, brilliant um, music director at the time. She worked so well with everybody and worked hard, hard hours in rehearsal. And also the other child in the show, eight-year-old, nine-year-old, step dancer champion was uh, Janice Lambert. So to have these young people be in the situation getting <laughs> basically a music education from heaven, working with all these wonderful people and um, both Janice Lambert and Emily have gone on to have full-time careers in the performing arts. Yay! Go team, go! The other thing that I'm really, really proud of or hold in my heart forever is how the community fell in love with Minerva and the reason we're doing a book now, Tom and I, is that when Tom and I are gone and we're getting older, um, we have a permanent record of Minerva's life and Moses Dolmage. So the fact that it touched people's hearts and made people proud of their community and healed some wounds in their own hearts from their own loss in life um, because they were inspired by this young teenage girl. So... That's pretty great. Sometimes it can be easier to look back than to look ahead, particularly when you're in the middle of a global pandemic. But I'd like to turn it over now to Alexandra Say, the current general manager for a look into the future of the region. So Alexandra, we have not met until today. 
You're new to the county, and I'm very old to the county. What brought you here? Well, hi, Monica. Nice to meet you. Same. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, the county brought me to the county. I was very attracted to the county in all its facets, and I got a place out here about six years ago now. Um, and I always intended to permanently relocate here to the county, uh, but I wasn't really sure on what that timeline would be on that. And then this job came up. <laughs> And that accelerated my timeline dramatically. Lovely. Well, we're grateful. Well, Being a member of the public that uses the region, yes, thank you for well, coming. Well, thank you for continuing to come to the region. I'll say that's been one of the most humbling and beautiful experiences of being here, even though it's been COVID, is the amount of community support that this place has in terms of our membership, our sponsors, our donors, the community at large, the people who pass me on the street or pass, you know, colleagues on the street and say, when are you going to be open? I miss it so much. Or thank you so much for continuing to do things while COVID has been happening. You know, it's, it's been really a marvelous experience um, to be able to serve that in the community here. I am so glad to hear that, but I wouldn't have expected anything less. <laughs> <laughs> spoken as an old-timer, yes. which is amazing. Well, even spoken as a current. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. So um, so what, you talked about the region, coming to the region, seeing the job. What was it about that that drew you here? Well, my background is in both theater and film on the creative side. So I have been a director for a number of years, both in theater and in film. I always imagined that coming to the county would involve, you know, freelance screenwriting from home. <laughs> but as a creative... It still can. It, it, it still can, yes. Well, after, as soon as we get broadband that can accommodate all that stuff. <laughs> uh, sure. And maybe when I'm not working 90 hours a week. But uh, that, that time will come. It will. But... Um, <laughs> I had always imagined that life out here would be life as a creative, because that's how I had envisioned myself moving here. But uh, this job came up, and let me backtrack. Like many creatives, I am not just a creative. I also work in the corporate field and in the education sector. Uh, that is a familiar story to, to many creatives. So my day jobs for many years have all revolved around either project management or communications and marketing or both. And the combination of directing and communications and project management all sort of really came together around this job. The project happens to be a building. Mm -hmm. For sure. <laughs> and the programming <laughs> happens to be a whole year of it, you know. But the skills were very much aligned with things I had done in a whole bunch of different areas of my prior life. And so this was the project that I really had been looking for, which brought together all my creative, my organizational, and my uh, everything I wanted to be doing. I wanted to be engaged in the community here. And this is certainly personally helping me do that, but it also gives me a way to give back to the community too. So you arrive just as COVID's hitting its absolutely most annoying early stage. Yeah, I arrived in December 2019, and three months later, we were shut down. Yes. Yes. It's been trial by fire. Mm -hmm. Really, eh? That's putting it mildly. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I was in the middle of learning a new job and a new place, when suddenly the rug was pulled out from underneath, not just me, but the entire community, and we had to do something about it. So I looked around and I went, well, when our building is closed and we have built ourselves on our building for a hundred years, what do you do? And the answer to me at the time was pretty clear. It's you get outside the building somehow, but how? The answer for us was hybrid programming. We got on that bandwagon before many people, um, but it's now become the catchphrase of the day, pivot and hybridize. 
But we approached city council for a grant to equip ourselves with streaming gear. So cameras, switchers, everything that we would need in order to get a show out to an audience that wasn't in our building. I was reading about that in the local newspapers. I found that very, very interesting. And good on you guys for for being able to do that tap dance. Do well, that tap dance. <laughs> <laughs> well, it certainly was a tap dance. Uh, it was certainly a direction that I don't think anyone could have envisioned before COVID. So in some ways, it's, it's very much a silver lining because it's somewhere that the organization never would have thought to go or the thinking of doing it would have taken five years of strategic planning, you know? And so we had to move or lose. We had to do something or risk losing a lot. Did you find it, having been a former councillor member for 10 years, <laughs> back in the days when culture, as I mentioned earlier in this podcast, that culture was not a... Culture was art. Culture was... A nice to have. Nice to have. Culture was a movie. Culture was uh, something on stage mm. that most people at our council table didn't go to, to be honest. Mm -hmm. And... Um, and they weren't raised in it or whatever the reasons were. What, what was the reaction of council when you took that to them? Well, I will say it was actually extremely positive because I think that what council does recognize is the value that having the regent brings, not just to Picton, but to the county at large. And I think they see that in terms of attracting new people to the county, in terms of desirability of real estate. I think they see that in other terms, not necessarily in terms of the actual art that we produce necessarily. Yes, I understand that. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Um, but they were very supportive because I think that they were also staring down the very long, dark tunnel of COVID and the unknown going, what are we going to do if we lose our theater? So if this is the only way that we can keep it, we got to keep it. Yes. Yes. I yeah, I'm glad to I'm glad to hear you say that because that's what I would have hoped from the council and I was not listening to the council meetings at that point in time. No, <laughs> Those on 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 the web and internet don't appeal to me, but seeing something from this stage or mm -hmm. something from another stage coming to me through the region does make sense to mm -hmm, me. Mm -hmm. I I think in terms of educating not just council, but the general public in terms of the value of art. I think in some ways COVID may have helped us in that because what's the very first thing people did when COVID hit? They went home and they looked for something to watch. Mm -hmm. They looked for something to entertain themselves with. And the, the thought of not having that made people pretty scared. <laughs> and so I think while that might not translate into funding dollars, yes, I think what COVID has done is shown people how important stories are right, and therefore how important organizations or venues like us are in terms of sharing those stories and enabling those stories. And one of the things I found about the Regent stage over the years is that it has shared local stories or it has shared uh, the common person's stories in one form or another. And there are so many young people that I can think of that have made their start on either the Mount Tabor stage or here mm -hmm. or at the county fair or some local venue. And invariably, they've gone from that smaller local space. And the big deal is to perform on this stage. And um, I, I know in this podcast that one of the things I've discovered preparing for it is that David Miracle has never performed on this stage. There's a group called the Wilkinsons who were Juno Award winners and Grammy nominee winners or nominees who have never got to perform on this stage. My goal would be to see that happen here. It's just crazy. This place would be full. Like it, they have history. The night that Megan and Caleb Hutton performed with instant rivalry, mm -hmm. just packed the house. Packed the house, but the energy. And uh, my daughter 
who goes by Miss Emily now, came back and did um, a Carol King show. Mm -hmm. And uh, Full House, the energy was just amazing. And the money went to back the build. The, the value added of this place to our community as a meeting place where people can do good things mm -hmm. and still have a great time doing it. Yeah. Excellent. Just well, excellent. There's a couple of things you've touched on there that I'll just pull out. One is supporting local. Two is giving young people a leg up. Mm -hmm. and, and three is the notion of producing versus presenting. Mm -hmm. So one of all three of those things are quite top priorities right now and for moving forwards. And they developed as priorities during COVID, but are continuing to fuel the organization moving forwards. One, support local, definitely. For a period of time during COVID when even we couldn't have anything on our stage, so we couldn't even live stream it, what did we do? We went and created community partnerships with other organizations where we could be live. So for example, we were at the Mustang Drive-In every Sunday throughout the summer for seven weeks. And every Sunday, we sponsored two local artists to come and perform. So that was our way of getting outside the walls of the yes. region, getting into community and supporting community. Um, one of the other things that we did was we, um, we live streamed from Festival Players' outdoor venue. So that was us taking the hybrid programming model outside of our own walls and uh, allowing people to be able to engage with artistic content from home or from wherever they were, but outside of our walls. But again, supporting local um, and supporting youth. Whether that's, whether that's bringing youth into the theater on a subsidized ticket because they've never been to the theater, or whether that's this podcast. Part of the reason for doing this podcast came out of our youth outreach engagement, um, sorry, it came out of our youth outreach and engagement initiative as a way of engaging with younger people, both in the production and on the listening side of the, of the house as well. So trying to meet young people where they're at, offer something that is of value to them, and offer a learning opportunity within that. Um, and like this podcast, this is an example of something that we, the Regent, are producing. We're not simply presenting it. It's not coming to us as a fait accompli, and we are presenting it as we do with many, many shows. That is mostly what we are as a presenter and a venue. Um, but looking ahead into the future, we're looking more at producing things like this, a podcast. This is creatively A to Z of Regent Theatre production. Mm -hmm. um, and so engaging community and engaging young people in new ways is front and center of what we want to do moving forwards. So I think that's a question now, with or without COVID, because we do not know what the future holds. What do you think is ahead for the region? <laughs> I don't have a crystal ball, but what I would like for the region is I would like to turn surviving mm -hmm. into thriving. For some time now and through COVID, we've been hanging on. We're here. We do what we do. I'd like to expand those offerings so that we can bring in new audiences and bring new people to our stages, like David Maracle. Mm -hmm. And I would like to see us, I would like to see us being able to create welcoming and engaging experiences that people young and old want to come back for. That's great. I mean, I, I think it's great. I'm just so happy. <laughs> I am so happy. We used to have a joke about uh, how many how many people have sat on the Regent Theatre Board? <laughs> Half the county. That was always kind of the reply. Half the county. Well, the county's changed. We have a lot of new people. And I'm thrilled when I look at the names on the board that I really don't know very many people at all. <laughs> I think it's great. I think it's great. Times are changing. And we need to, as we as the Regent, as an organization, we need to change with it. Sure. You know, and that's that's our programming, that's our audience, that's our membership base, because 
like all theaters, like all performing arts, you know, we suffer from the same problem, which is an aging, uh, an aging audience base and an aging volunteer base. And mm-hmm. we are very dependent on that right now. Yes. And so we need to bring in new people. And in order to do that, we need to program for those interests and we also need to reflect those interests to those audiences so it means hiring young people yes it means bringing in new board members yes it means it means reflecting the community to the community i think uh i think one of the things that we have those of us who sat on the board over the years have recognized that if one travels at all in canada that you come to communities where they are struggling because they want to set up a theater. Mm -hmm. They want to set up a performance space. They want to have, bluntly put, more than their arena, Mm -hmm. right? More than their high school stage that isn't appropriately lit or sound rigged or whatever. And here we are with a richness in Prince Edward County of different size stages um, for giving us opportunities to perform, Mm -hmm. whether it's music or artistic or whatever it might be. And um, I I just think we're so richly blessed. And the fact that there are people that are interested to keep carrying it on, good on. And thank you very much. Thank you very much for being here. Tell me now before we finish uh, the Truth and Reconciliation concert. Mm Mm-hmm. Tell me what it's about. Tell the people that are listening what it's about. <laughs> and it's on September the 30th. September the 30th. And it's free. And it's free. September 30th is our very first live concert with a live audience in the 19 months since we closed down. Yay! Woo! <laughs> <laughs> so it is very much the culmination of uh, 19 months of effort, including a major capital campaign called Raise the Curtain. We are now raising the curtain you have the money we have the money part of the reason that that campaign was called raise the curtain is because we needed to fund a new fire curtain yes i was aware of that which we now have good so is it paid for that's what i'm asking you yes excellent it is congratulations thank you it has been a long yes i'm aware of that (laughs) i'm aware of that we have it so we are raising it and we are raising it on september 30th September 30th is Truth and Reconciliation Day. We call our concert Truth and Reconciliation Concert. Excellent. Art is action. And we're going to do what we do best, which is make some art on a day of national reflection. Terrific. Terrific. Yeah. And who else going to be on the bill? I'm thrilled that we have an entirely indigenous bill for Truth and Reconcil- our Truth and Reconciliation Action concert. We'll open with a special performance by E.O. Argos, followed by David R. Maracle, mm-hmm. Tom Wilson, and then Digging Roots. Great. I am so excited to be welcoming these artists to our stage. And I only wish we could have more people in the audience because we're still limited with gathering capacity. So we are almost, in fact, we might be sold out for the live show. Mm -hmm. But we do, we are streaming it. So you can watch it online for free. You still need to book your ticket because um, we just need, you need to, you need to book it in order to get access to the link. Yeah, broadband in the county, too. And broadband in the county, which <laughs> is, you know. Where I live. Where uh, I live. Maybe not everybody. Uh, you know, if you're in town, you're okay. But not where I live, out in the south end. No. It can be a problem. But uh, you do need to book your ticket in advance. But I encourage you to watch the show if you can't be here in person and rock out and reflect on the land that we're on and the privilege that we have to be here living in this amazing place and um, think about the stories that we share. Yes. Yes. And the stories and the richness we add to each other's stories. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. That's great. That's great. Well, thank you, Alexandra. Nice to meet you. Nice to finally talk to you. And I wish you and the Regent Board and all your staff 
who have helped put together this podcast the very best as we're going forward. Thank you very much, Monica, for being here with us today and for taking the time and your insights. Thank you. Thank you. Our next guest is David R. Miracle. David is of the Bear Clan and was born on the Aquasasne Mohawk Reserve, but is called Tyendinaga home for over 35 years. Just as we were getting ready for this podcast, um, David and I were having a chat back and forth, and uh, I was sure that I'd heard him in earlier times. And we're both kind of racking our memory to see whether that was here at the region in some form, uh, group or whatever he was in back in the 2000s when I was on the board, or whether it was back when my daughter Emily was performing at the local high school on the stage and some fundraising event for the community. And then I was also at a water ceremony, and it was over uh, in Tyendinaga, and we've just confirmed that yes, that was their place too. So I kind of already have a connection here. I feel like I'm connected. Is that okay? I think so I think so. Yes. You were there. You're okay. starting to come through. I feel yeah. it. Yeah. <laughs> well, the years have gone by, and uh, David is a multi-talented artist known internationally for both his music and his stone carvings, which appear in numerous public and private collections, including those of Nelson Mandela, Dan Aykroyd, and the Emperor of Japan, just to name a few. With no formal training in music, David is an award-winning singer, songwriter, and musician who has mastered many instruments, including the Iroquoian and the Celtic flutes. And today we're going to have an opportunity to hear some of David's work. So thank you for joining us, David. But I understand that aside from music and sculpting, you're going to start with one of your original poems. Yes, uh, it's a poem I've written about... Uh a lot of our people that in, have inspired me to uh, do what I do is uh, those that continue uh, working with their traditional ways and the values that they apply through their traditional ways to their life and how they pass it down to their family. It makes uh, it, makes it uh, fun for me to be able to uh, take those things that I see and put it into poetry form and into song so other people can enjoy it as well. Well, it's yours. So the, the poem I've written, uh, I usually do this uh, when I'm performing. I'll create a soundtrack to uh, start, the, start the ambience uh, flowing. And then I will start with this poem, and it's called Woman of Tradition. And it goes like this. Once upon a time, not too long ago, there laid a bearskin rug on a blanket of snow beside a fire pit. With dancing flames, there sat a red-skinned woman with a sweetgrass braid. I could see she was a woman of tradition. Her body and her soul was on a mission, and her mind's eye will retain a vision of the spirit world. She rose to her feet. She begun to wave her hands that clutched that smoking sweetgrass braid. The rising smoke went to her connection. She prayed, she gave thanks in all directions. And I could see that she was a woman of tradition. Her body and her soul was on a mission. And her mind's eye will retain that vision of the spirit world. She began to sing, chant, and pray. I watched the animals as they walked her way. And I was so careful not to make a sound as she turned this place to sacred ground. And I could see that she was that woman of tradition and her body and her soul was on a mission and her mind's eye will retain that vision of the spirit world. Of the spirit world. She began to sing, chant and pray and I watched them animals walk her way. And I was still careful not to make a sound as she turned that place to sacred ground. Aware of her surroundings, a presence she sensed was there. As she sang her breath, it sat like clouds compressed by the cool still air. And I could see that she was that woman of tradition. And her body and her soul was on a mission. And her mind's eye will retain a vision of the spirit world, of the spirit world. 
Well, that gave me shivers and I closed my eyes and the visualization was fabulous. Thank you. What a treat. What a treat. So you've said that your music arose from your sculpting practice. Can you tell us more about that? Well, being in my studio, it's, uh, it's a little tedious sometimes when you're just fidgeting with stones and it takes a while to turn a stone into something. So I thought I'd take something and start tapping and making music and things just started to evolve from there, you know, and I found that, you know, having something to make sound with and while I was studying the stone to see what wanted to come out of that stone, I was creating a whole new venue for my life and that was the music and uh, it just seemed to work and I started uh, on a journey um, to, to, to go and show my art and one of the journeys I had purchased a flute off a traveling salesman on our territory and it was it was fun because I I picked it up and it was this is something I really want in my life this flute I couldn't put it down I tried to play it with the the rock and roll boys (laughs) how'd that go oh it didn't go well they're like (laughs) Dude, you know what? You need to go go do something different. Go plug that music. in. <laughs> we want we want rock and roll. We want guitars and heavy metal, and and it just has no place right here. So I'm like, hmm, all right, whatever, boys. So I I was asked to go on a trip to the states and uh, and uh, down to Oklahoma, <clears throat> and when I was. Uh, when I was on my travels, I had brought my flute with me, and I know you're not supposed to be doing this, but I was holding the steering wheel and with my elbows, and I was. Oh yeah, the you're flute. one of those guys, eh? Oh, I'm one of those early guys. texters. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> so I'm on my way, and I'm playing the flute, and I'm just enjoying the quality. I had three days to drive there, so I was making up songs as I as as I went, and uh, when I got there, I didn't realize that. Oklahoma was like the flute capital of of the world. Really? And there was native flute players all over the place at this venue. So it was a fine art show and uh I was just like I when I parked in the in the lot I could hear flutes going. I could see these little sound systems set up at their booths. And I was like, "Wow, this is this is just amazing." So I walked over to the first guy that I that I could see and I said, man, I said, do you mind if I just try out your, your microphone and, and play my flute into your mic? And he said, yeah, go ahead, man, knock yourself out. You know, he's one of those guys. And, mm-hmm. and I said, thanks. So I, I walked up to his flute or to his microphone and I took my flute and he said, you got to put the flute right up by the hole up by the top where the mouth is. So I went up there and I started to blow and he had all this nice, uh, uh, I guess effects on the mic and it started to echo out to the crowd well if if anybody knows anything about musicians when you're around a lot of musicians at the at one time you start picking up their their songs right but I was fresh I was, I was fresh on the scene you know and I was that fresh boy in the crowd and, <laughs> and I'd started playing all those things that I was playing on the way to the show and people stopped what they were doing. They're like listening. They, I caught their ear. And not only did I catch the ear of all the boys around there that had the flutes, the, there was a radio station and they said, wow, can, do you mind if we interview you and can we record you? And I said, uh, I don't know. You'll have to ask the guy here that owns the booth. You know, he's paid his fees yes. and, and he's there trying to sell his music and his wares. And the guy said, you know what, just go ahead, take this one. So I said, fine. So they asked me, uh, they asked me what the song was I was playing. I said, well, I haven't really come up with a title yet. This is just something new. They said, and how long have you been playing flute? And I didn't want to say, say three days, you know, I, so I said, well, I've been playing for some short time now. And I think I really like what I'm doing with the flute. I love it. So I, I didn't want to make anybody feel bad. You know? Did you put out a CD called Trip to Oklahoma with a Flute? I, I think I'm going to. There you go. I gave you a title. <laughs> Does this mean I get a cut in the royalties or whatever? Oh, we'll work on that one. <laughs> At least you'll get a free CD. I'll take it. I'll take that. That would be great. Wow. I just, I, I need a backup. I need a backup question. You're sculpting. Are you formally trained in sculpting or is that a... 
You tell me the story. The sculpting just came natural and it, it helped to evolve because of the stories of our people and the legends and the oral tradition that's been passed down and my time spent with the elders and, and learning all these stories. I was gifted a, a couple pieces of stone and the the funny thing is, is I, I, ha I didn't know, have a clue on what I was doing with stone, but somebody said, you should really try it. It's really nice. So I... I was playing around and, and we put some water on there and when you put water on the stone it kind of brings out um, the beauty of the stone because it allows it to be wet. And so I, I was doing going through all these things. I got myself a few files and some rasps and I was working on the piece and uh, I carved this little, uh, just filed this little guy sitting on the side of a, a ledge and I did a little cave behind him with a little piece pipe in there. and. And my dad told me at the time, he says, David, he said, uh, he said, you, you might want to think about taking this to the show with me. My dad was an international lecturer and uh, he spoke the language fluent and uh, he spoke all the dialects of the Six Nation Confederacy. Wow. Woo. Yeah. So my dad was uh, a, a huge inspiration in my life. So when he said to me, you should bring your piece and, and follow, you know, we'll, we'll set a table up and you can set it there and maybe put it out for sale and see if you can make some money with it. And I'm like, whoa, this this is crazy. Sell a stone, make some money. So and was, how old would you have been at that time? Oh, my gosh. Uh, well, that was back in 1985 when I started. So let's do the math here. I can't do the math. Okay. You'll have to do the math. <laughs> oh, uh, I think let's just say I was I was in, teenager. Yes. Wow. Cool. So from that, uh, I I didn't sell the piece. People were coming by, and and you know they were like, they were like, wow, that's pretty nice. What's that made out? Oh, stone. You know, I I had no clue. I just <laughs> youngster, right? So so my dad says, oh, you know, don't worry. He says maybe you should carve another one, and you know maybe you should come to the next show with me. So I took it to a few shows and it sat there and, and, you know, people were like, this is really nice, David. This is nice. You nice work, but, but no, no, no money in my pockets. Right. So my dad said to me, he says, David, he said, maybe you should put a title on it. Maybe you should make a little card. Maybe you should put a story with it and maybe you should stick a rabbit fur underneath it, you know, to <laughs> elevate it up on a little pedestal. So I listened to my dad and I did all those things, those little tricks and uh, went there and finally somebody came up and he says, what are you asking for that? Like, oh boy, what am I asking for that? I said, uh, 300 bucks. He said, sold. He <gasps> said, I, 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 I want that piece. Wow. And I was like, whoa. I said, I just sold a stone, you know, <laughs> it took me a while, but I sold a stone, you know, and uh, from that day, I decided this is what I want to do with my life. Carve stone. Wonderful. So story. I started carving all these stones and my dad said to me, he says, David, he said, you know what? You just stay home. He said, because now I think you're on, you're on the road to success here. I think you're going to be successful in this area because of the people that he came, saw come up to look at the piece. Right? So dad said why don't you just stay home and carve and i'll take the pieces and put them out for you so he started on his on his journey taking my pieces and i'd box them up and put little stories beside them or or in the box for my dad he'd put them out on the table and uh and he'd come home you know after his trip you know after four, three or four days and he'd be bringing me money and the money started growing it was it started out at three and then it went up to five then went to 600 700 bucks and he'd come home and he'd said david i need more carvings so i i'd be in there and, and i'm just working there's stone dust everywhere energizer bunny <laughs> energizer bunny for sure so he he was pulling i couldn't wait to see my dad pulling the driveway and at that point in my life i was you know i was i was making like several thousands of dollars with my art so I knew now for a fact, this is where I'm going. So, you know, to have a dad like mine and to understand who he was and what he did for me was amazing because when my dad passed away, my dad passed away speaking in the tongue that he was beaten for speaking all of his life. Wow. Now that just gave me 
major chills. Thank you for sharing that. So my dad told me, it's hard when I say that. But yes, I understand that. I can appreciate that. And you can just take as long as you need to get to where you can talk again. <laughs> so dad actually, when he passed away, just give me a second here. You bet. You bet. He had... Uh, my mom and my mom told us boys to go up to the house and she said I want you to uh I want you to go up to the house and pick things out of your dad's that remind you so I took my dad's moccasins so we all go up and we're looking around through the house and uh and the one thing I really wanted was dad's beaded moccasins that he wore and I wear them all the time when I perform. And, uh, and he also had a turtle rattle that he wore. It's a traditional, we, we use these rattles to shake them and honor the earth. We sing songs with them. And the turtle represents the earth. This is why you hear our people when we say Turtle Island that takes in, takes in all of North America and where we, where we grow our vegetables and plants and the things that sustain our life. And there's many stories that, that I tell that revolves around Turtle Island. You know, we have the three sisters that were brought here. So all these things that were taught to me is, is very important. So I wanted those things that my dad wore when he told these stories to be close to me. So it would kind of give me that power and that energy to have something that was worn by a very powerful elder which happened to be my dad. So I was blessed to have an elder in my life that was actually my dad. So we're looking around the house, and I just took off to a little spot where my dad used to like to go, and he, nobody really went there. He kept his, my dad was a craftsman too, and he, cut, he did a lot of work with leather, and my dad went coast to coast selling, selling his uh, wares on the front of his car, as a native person, we didn't need that. Uh, we didn't need a license to sell or anything. We would just stop along the road and put a blanket down and sell our crafts and our handmade things. And that's what I did all my life. That's how I learned to bring myself up as a boy and sell my art along highways. And then I started going into buildings. So anyway, back to the story. So I go up into his private space and, and there was uh, over the garage and it was in the attic door I pushed it open and there was all my carvings in there that he had told me he sold but he wanted to inspire me to say that people were buying these from all over the place you know and he was bringing me all this money and he was actually making himself go bang <laughs> buying I love all it. my art <laughs> and uh, to inspire me to be the person I am today with my art wow the love of a dad eh? absolutely did your mom know my mom, I think, I don't know. I never really asked my mom. So then she never would have to lie to you. <laughs> no, no, you're right. Oh, that's so spectacular. <laughs> I, I, um, I am a firm believer that when, when a young person gets a passion, mm -hmm. that if they have that passion deep enough in their soul, that it will carry them through all those horrid years of growing up and being tempted and wandering away but you got this thing you anchor back to yes. and in my kids lives it was music and dance and theater and I was so grateful for those things and yes. so yeah, your story really strikes for me because good for, oh you're so fortunate to have a parent like that absolutely wow what a great story you know he wasn't he wasn't that dad that took me out to you know, I, I wasn't involved with sports and all these things, but my dad wasn't really around a lot, but the, the times he was, because he was out helping a lot of other indigenous children, you know, so I just allowed him, you know, I don't, I didn't allow him, but I just allowed myself to, to just, you know, amuse myself in ways I could when my dad wasn't there. So, you know, but the power of my dad's words when we were together and his actions actually spoke volumes in my life as a boy. So, the Truth and Reconciliation concert that's coming up, 
Aren't the reconciliation a- concert. Reconciliation. I just heard that. Like Alexander just told me that a few minutes ago, and I'm going, "Oh, I didn't. You know, I read the poster, but I didn't register that difference in the words." So, it's great, eh? Absolutely. Reconciliation. Um, what's that mean to you? Uh, it means a lot of things to me. It's, um, you know, it's uh, it means that we have that uh, voice that's uh, in that day that's coming up. It, it's not about celebrating. It's about being a part of our lives and, and, and locking arms with our people and saying, you know what, there needs to be justice here and there needs to be, you know, look at this as a, as a homicide, you know, these bodies that they found. So our people have new things to write about, new things to talk about, but also those ones that are suffering that, you know, I think every Indigenous person has been affected by this and there is that residue that's left behind that has touched all of us, you know. And I think we, we've all have somebody in our family line that's been touched in some way. You know, you go back just far enough and you, oh, my uncle, my auntie, my grandpa, grandpa, my grandma was there. You know, my brother was there. My nephew is even there. Okay. So when you hear people saying these things, it really touches close to home with our people. So having these things brought up, I would like to see the government make this a national holiday where everybody gets that day off then it's going to speak volumes to to the rest of the world because then people are going to go why do we get this day off you know what's special about this day well let me tell you why you're sitting at the beach and 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 all these things because there was people out there that you know they didn't do such great things and you need to know about it and we need to rectify these things and the government needs to make sure you know in the compassion of all need to make sure that we embrace the, the indigenous people. Because, uh, you know, even Chani Winjack, the story of Chani Winjack, all these things really touch close to home. So this, this stage will be filled with indigenous performers. Absolutely, and I'm so excited to be out performing again. Um, this pandemic has really held us back and to, to be intimate again and to be live with the, the, the crowd is, is where it's at, you know, and, and the feelings that we can have. And I, Kim and I, my wife, we handpicked uh, some of the artists that we want that we've traveled with and uh, we've played with before. And it's just, it's gonna be, it's gonna be a celebration of, of us getting together and just sharing our excitement and energy. And hopefully it will be infectious to the rest of the people that hear our stories and watch who we are and what we can do. I. I, I look forward to it. It's and, great. And Digging Roots is, uh, th- they're a great band, and, and ju- the, just the name Digging Roots should speak volumes. And Tom Wilson, a great performer, he has a great story. He just has his newfound, uh, you know, uh, persona of Mohawk uh, uh, ancestry now that he never really knew about. And now he's all excited to dig deeper and deeper. You know, I don't know about the, the, the extent of his past and everything, but I know that he's going to probably share that with the people. And there's uh, another artist that I'm excited for all to hear, and her name is Eo Argos. And she is uh, be, she's being produced by a gentleman that actually travels with me, and uh, he's Chinese and uh, big inspiration in my life. He's a multi-instrumentalist himself. And he just opened up a record company called Edom Squid. And uh, he's, uh, he works in the movie industry, film, soundtrack work. And in fact, we just did uh, music for Bell Media, uh, five tracks for Bell Media. So I thought that was pretty sweet to be able to get that gig in before this gig. So, <laughs> um, And I, I want to share a couple songs, too. Um, one is... Uh, from the album called uh, Spirit World, Universal Meditation, and the song is called Spirit Dreams. Spirit Dreams. <laughs> Sorry about that. My mind just took a blank. But Spirit Dreams, uh, the album was actually designed after my brother was uh his life was taken in a car accident so i went right into the studio and i started to meditate and uh 
I started to uh, play all these songs for my brother, and the titles of these songs are all about who he was in his life. So when you <clears throat> actually buy the album or listen to the album, you'll see why I named them that. And the uh, the the quality of the uh, the song the songs and the sound of the songs are very unusual because I'm playing unusual instruments that people don't normally get to hear around the area. So I played didgeridoos and hang drums and 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 juice harps and and different things and a lot of uh, different uh, native love flutes, a lot of percussion, string work. So it's uh, I add all these things together and I create these uh, these cool vibes and sounds that people hopefully will will rest and 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 get rest from and maybe take them on a spiritual journey, maybe uh, relax them, you know and. I put them right in the middle of the woods with my music. So these kinds of uh, of compilations is something that when I see the crowd out out there starting to fall asleep, and and I think I've done my work, <laughs> and it's a good thing. I'd rather have that than an applause. <laughs> Fun! What a great take that is because. Uh, um, I happened to be at church this morning, and my minister was talking about that same <laughs> did sort he put of idea. You to sleep? Well, no, I didn't talk about the going to sleep, but just, you know, I talked about that Yes. stopping, quiet, pay attention, Absolutely. listen, yeah, reflect and all and that. And that's why I like to work in the evening time when everybody's mind is shut down. When, when the darkness comes, you know, is when the artist usually their mind starts to develop new ideas and they start going into themselves and their thoughts because there's no dogs barking and things moving around and cars driving to, to distract you. Now, what's the second song you're going to be doing? The second song is called The Lifeblood of Mother Earth. And the reason we call it The Lifeblood of Mother Earth is because that represents the water. Her blood that she allows us to have to sustain our life is the water. And without the water, we wouldn't be here. And without taking care of the water and and knowing just how precious water is, we're we're doing we're doing a uh, a bad service to ourselves and the rest of the world to not pay attention to that because we are water. This is why in 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 our culture, and uh, and it's been proven by this scientist called Dr. Emoto that when you pray to the water and you tell the water you love it, you play music around it, it cleans itself. And you can actually see it actually move, you know. And, uh, and, it, and, and the women water walkers have been walking around the Great Lakes and scooping up the water and, and praying over it and doing ceremony and then taking it back in and putting it back into the lake so it blends with the rest of the waters. And we're, we're made up of water. I, I don't know the, the exact percentage. Let me throw something out, maybe 87%. It's more water. than that. It's in the 90s. 90s? 90s. So when we tell each other, Ganorunkwa, meaning love medicine, when we say I love you, we're cleaning you each other from the inside out. So our people love to hear that. And when we do these big bear hugs and we, we I love you, you know, brother, sister, it cleans us, and that's what we need more of. I hope you'll tell people that from the stage. I think that's a message we all need to hear right now. Absolutely. So there we go. Well, wow, that was great. Thank you, David. We cannot wait to see you on stage at the Regent next week. Thanks for sharing your stories with us today and your creations. Thanks for it has me. been a real privilege for me personally. And I just want to let you know that. Thank you for having me. It's been beautiful.
Well, that's it for today, folks. Thank you for listening. Tune in next month for A County's Ghost Stories. Follow the Regent Theatre on social media for programming updates. A special thank you to today's storytellers, artists, and the community and government organizations which made this podcast possible, including the County of Prince Edward and Loyalist College. This episode was created with the assistance of Megan Hutton as consulting producer. Made in the County is a Regent Theatre production produced by Logan Summers, executive produced by Alexandra Say. The opening theme is courtesy of Sam Dubois. If you liked what you heard here, subscribe on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen. That's it for this episode. See you next time.